Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Blood of My Blood. This is our first episode. I'm your dungeon master, Graham Ward, and uh, I've got a few of my wonderful friends here. So let's go around and have everyone say a little bit about uh, your interests or uh, projects you might be working on. And we'll start with Emma Carter. And go ahead also and uh, bring up your character name, just so we can kind of get that in our minds. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Carter. I will be playing Adelaide. Uh, I am a member of Ghostlight RPGs. I was part of Childish Things that we did last year. And I am also the producer slash DM of a actual play D&D podcast called, the Spell, or called Spellbound at the Spell Pod. Um, we are an all lady, fantastical fantasy podcast. Thank you, Emma. Awesome. Uh, That's let's. Me. Let's have Justin Barron introduce himself. Hey there, it's uh, my name is Justin Barron. Um, I'm playing the character Tiago in uh, in Blood of My Blood. I am a producer here for Ghost Led RPGs. Um, I host a show called The Green Room on Tuesday nights at uh, 8:30 Central PM. Um, and yeah, um, I'll be running uh, uh, Pitfalls and Ponies on Sunday mornings as well. Thanks. Okay, uh, we also have Ted Bushman. Hey there, uh, this is my first time doing something with Ghost Light RPGs, which I am so excited to be uh, finally eligible by being creepy enough to be involved in this particular <laughs> show, because all the other shows are too nice and full of just wonderful, delightful people. And so uh, Graham was like, ah, this guy, creepy, dark. So I'm really, really stoked to be involved with this. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm a, you know, theater producer and creator did a musical write science fiction i do all, all sorts of things um and also i'm going through a pandemic right now i mean it's just like a personal thing you guys wouldn't understand um but uh i uh am playing briar denovan uh, that's my character's name uh in this thing very excited thank you and last but not least william sinclair uh, hello, everybody. Um, this is my first time as well um, doing anything with Ghostlight RPG. Um, Graham was gracious enough to invite me to come hang out and play with all these wonderful people. Um, when I'm not doing this, uh, I'm a PhD student at Texas Tech University um, studying theater, immersive horror, and all sorts of fun stuff that is tangential to this kind of thing. Um, for tonight, uh, well, not just tonight, for the remainder of Blood of My Blood, I'll be playing uh, Theodore. Great, thank you. Uh, let me give a little bit of an introduction to our setting. Um, Blood of uh, Dark Plain is the name of the setting. This is a uh, sort of a weird horror setting uh, made for fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. So we'll be playing with the fifth edition rules. Um, there are some additional elements uh, like additional uh, ancestries and things like that. Um, we've also got uh, quite a crew of characters who have <laughs> signed on for this particular story. Um, the characters in this story are members of the family, which is led by mother. Um, those two th things slash people, those, those narrative elements have no other name in the minds of our characters. Um, they've been members of the family for uh, various amounts of time, some their entire lives and others uh, only more recently. Uh, but uh, to back up a little bit, Dark Plain is a setting that um, it weaves an undercurrent of dread and horror into what seems otherwise to be a mundane, um, roughly uh, pseudo-historical world. Uh, this is not a typical medieval fantasy setting. Um, and so right up front, we should give a little bit of a content warning. This is a horror game. Um, we are aiming for something like an R rating. Um, we'll try not to be gratuitous. Um, and we will uh, just warn you now that there will be certainly depictions of violence, depictions of um, potential body invasion. Um, there will be references, although no, uh, no dramatized uh, scenarios of self-harm. Um, 
there there may be murder um, and there will be forms of madness. Uh, and I think it's worth stating that the madness depicted in this is not intended to represent um, mental illness. This is more of, think of it as a kind of a fantasy madness, the sort of um, idea of madness as being something that your mind experiences when it is um, exposed to things that are not of the, the regular world. So uh, in the setting Dark Plane, the Dark Plane itself is a, a kind of mysterious, only whispered about realm of absolute void in which live twisted, uh, you might call them Lovecraftian creatures. And the influence of the Dark Plane is so infectious um, that those who touch or even uh, learn about it can become twisted in body and mind. So um, with that said, uh, I think we will begin to set the stage here for the beginning of our story. The ship on which uh, you're all traveling has been cutting its way across the vein of the Impeldium Sea for about five, three to five days. Um, the time has has lengthened and, and made you unaware of what time it is at any given moment. Um, the drudgery of the ship's rocking, creaking, groaning even, um, is getting incessant and it's been wearing away at your patience. You know that you're heading toward Ordesos, a remote island city which holds the promise of freedom and to some on this ship, salvation. The family was driven out of their previous uh, place of residence. Um, a group of about 60 people who lived on a compound together, um, practicing uh, certain philosophical uh, traditions or um, experiments, attempting to bind themselves to one another in a way that promoted good um, self-improvement and uh, didn't have any particular religious bent, although there are some religious characters who uh, have been considered leaders now of the family, uh, which is a recent development. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, things got a little bit tense with um, the neighbors in your former residence and you were driven out. Uh, there was actually a mob that stormed the compound that the family was living in. And uh, you were forced to expedite mother's plans to board the ship rally and head out in the sea toward Ordesos, where she has promised that you will find everything you've been seeking and the plan that has been waiting to be fulfilled all along will finally come to fruition. So as we open, Briar and Adelaide. It is the deep of night. You hope that most of the rest of the ship is asleep, other than the few crewmen who are patrolling uh, the deck. And you have chosen this spot, maybe just by the center mast of the ship, to have a private conversation, hoping that the roar of the waves will drown out uh, anyone who might listen in, uh, because you have some important things to discuss. Um, why don't we go ahead and have um, Emma, would you describe what an observer might see in Adelaide? Adelaide is a young woman of noble birth. She appears to be human, although if she were to move her hair, one would notice that she does have pointed ears. Uh, Adelaide is half elf. Uh, an ancestor far in her past fell in love with one of the Fae, and so Adelaide now has uh, half-elf ears, but that's the only thing that would make her look anything other than human. Uh, she has long hair that is half up. Uh, she has a necklace around her neck with a little token at the bottom of it, shaped like a cat. And she looks uh, like, a, like a wonderful, like a good girl. She looks like a formal lady. Excellent. And how about Briar? Briar is an imposing figure, at a little over six foot. He uh, um, is rather broad, uh, bearded, 
with long hair. Um, he carries himself a little bit hunched, uh, largely to not to appear as tall as he is uh, when he goes into into rooms, um, but uh, walks with uh, imperiousness. Um, that's what you would notice. He probably has a big long trench coat because who doesn't have a big long trench coat? No. Okay, and um, you hear the creak of someone walking past and you hush your conversation for a moment. And then once they've gone, you have the opportunity to resume what you're going to discuss. How fair are you on this boat? I am well. How are you, Briar? The damn thing keeps moving. <laughs> and not in the directions that I'd like. <sighs> Can't sleep very well. It seems like I'm, it's been days since I've slept a full night. Well, at least three days. And there will be yes. many more. Yes, hopefully I will acclimate. Have you... Has Selby let you see her? I was going to ask you the same thing. I have not yet spoken with her or entered her chambers. There have been people there whenever I've been there. Do you know what happened? Do I know what happened? To her. What the, the nature of what occurred. Oh... All I know is that she's very upset. Uh, I don't, I, I don't know anything more other than she was upset over Marcissus, and ever since she has kept to herself. At least she doesn't want to see me. I had thought perhaps she would want to see you. I thought so as well, but uh, to lose one's fiance. By violence, it is uh, something I, I, of which I have no experience. Um, Nor I. She must feel so very alone. One question I have. Is there anything that she might have written? Something that might indicate how he... How he left us, how he became law, one of the lost, as mother would call them. I, if there is that information, it seems that someone would want to find it, want to make sure that it is uh, kept by those who should know. Oh, I believe there is. Perhaps. As you're, as you're standing there speaking, um, <laughs> continuing the kind of veil that's over the meaning behind your conversation, you both notice looking down toward the prow of the ship, through the rigging, the ropes that hold up the sails and and masts, uh, almost like a rib cage, heading straight toward the prow. On the very end of the ship, there is a dark figure, just calmly standing at the end of the ship and you can tell by the silhouette that you see that the figure is looking in your direction not moving the rest of the crew are, are either ambling around um you might see them coiling rope or or performing other tasks this figure is almost completely still and just facing you and adelaide you certainly recognize the shape of the figure because it is in the shape of Marsus, uh, Selby's fiance, who is now dead, and whom you knew very well. Do you see that, Briar? Or do my weary eyes deceive me? I, uh, Briar sort of um, unconsciously takes just a, one, a small step, kind of making sure that his body is in between Adelaide and this figure. Um, does does Briar recognize it or just see a shadow? Um, you would probably recognize the form of Marsus. He had a distinctive kind of tumbling uh, head of golden locks that, that you would recognize. Maybe the moon, which is behind his head, um, is just illuminating it enough that you can see his golden hair. 
This is some strange illusion. Too much salt in the water, perhaps. I hope you will remember, Briar, that Selby is very lucky to have someone like you in her life who would do anything to protect her. Briar, sort of, you know, flaring a little bit his, his nostrils and just sort of staring at this figure, starts walking towards it. Okay. And Adelaide will follow, reaching for him as if to stop him, although she probably would not be able to. <laughs> Yeah, he'll um, you know, sort of feel the tug, but keep pulling, keep going. Okay, as you slowly walk down the deck of the ship, it's a long walk, maybe um, maybe 50 feet at least to the, the prow of the ship. By the time you reach there, you've passed a few obstacles that um, gave a moment in which you wouldn't have been able to keep the figure in your vision. And you do find now at about 20 feet from where he was standing, there is there's no longer anyone. But you do have the sense that the moon seems to have grown almost three times in size. Uh, like you would imagine if you're moving toward the moon, it's not gonna change much in size. But in this instance, it's as though it's closer to you now that you've moved that 50 feet. This damn ship, what's I happening? I cannot say that I enjoy the ocean. <laughs> what does this mean? Is this some, some magic, some enchantment? No. It couldn't be. It must just be... It must just be the night, and... the fact that we have had to leave so suddenly, and that we have not been able to speak with Selby since the incident. And I'm sure once we, we do, and we will, all will be well, and we will not feel haunted by... these feelings. At that, um, Adelaide's silver cat uh, creeps just along the deck, swirls around your left leg, and begins pawing at your heel, uh, signaling that it wants to be um, picked up. Can everyone see my cat? Briar does not see a cat there, and you would probably have learned that this cat is not visible to anyone else. Ah, well, then, Briar, um, I, I must bid you adieu. Um, I, I hope you sleep well tonight. And Adelaide is going to excuse herself so that she can go somewhere private and pick up her cat. Okay, as Adelaide um, walks off, uh, the crew begin um, taking up a... A shanty. You just hear a few of them singing this long, low song, and it kind of punctuates the conversation. So we'll now move to uh, lower in the decks of the ship, um, below, in uh, the area where the Doctor Hamelian sees those who are in need of their care. We have Tiago. Um, you're standing there with Himalian. Uh, this is someone you know very well. Um, Himalian uh, uses they, them pronouns, um, is a very respected and actually was kind of a celebrated lecturer before um, joining the family and, and considered one of the foremost surgeons in the empire of Aracule. Uh, they did have an unfortunate accident after joining the family about uh, 10, 15 years ago. You weren't around at that time, I don't think, but um, you would have heard stories about how Himalayan was hit by what was termed a runaway cart. And in the incident, the cart actually took off their lower jaw. And so Himalayan has no lower jaw um, and is not able to use their, their voice. And so Himalayan signs and most of the inner circle of the family uh, are very fluent in Himalayan signs. Um, so I'll be translating uh, what you understand of that. Sure. Um, and uh, at the moment, Himalayan is uh, just doing a, a, genuine, a general checkup on a uh, one of the sailors who has been complaining of an upset stomach for the last few days. Um, and while having this uh, checkup, uh, Himalayan is, is also occasionally looking over to you and signing um, with concern because at the moment, 
they are saying, no one has let me in to see Selby. Have you heard anything? No, I can't say that I have. I, I pray for her, but um, I have heard no news. Well, we should both hope that your prayers are heard. Um, why don't you go ahead, uh, by the way, and describe for us what an observer would notice about Tiago. Tiago um, is very <laughs> almost sickly looking. <laughs> um, his skin tone is, is dark naturally, but um, it, he just looks like he could use more sun. <laughs> Um, he has scars all over his skin, his face. Um, uh, if it, he covers up most of his skin because of this. Um, he, he has long, long hair, uh, matted and knotted in different places. Um, string, uh, st string, stringy, I suppose. Um, but his eyes are warm. His eyes do give off a sort of calm, um, which is good because he also holds a, a holy symbol of his um, his lady Umhasa. Um, I guess, yeah. Great. Um, Himalayan says, uh, so mother hasn't uh, made any mention of where Selby is being kept. I haven't even been able to, to determine uh, which cabin she's in. I, I have not heard either. To be honest with you, I've had other things on my mind. I <clears throat> sometimes find myself just staring out at the ocean. I'm not used to this much sea. <laughs> it uh, makes me uneasy. Yes, well, you haven't been uh, on any voyages. I used to be a surgeon in the military, and so uh, I can assure you that so far this has been a very, very successful few days. We haven't had any accidents. You have absolutely nothing to worry about, okay? Yes. It um, definitely puts me at ease a little more knowing that but you you find purpose here. I mean, it must have been fulfilling being among so many others in the military who, um, I don't know. Sometimes I suppose I, I wonder where we're heading. <laughs> well, I can tell you I had the same feeling when I was in the military. Uh, Yes, I, I, can, I can understand. I can only speak to my experience, but I will tell you that um, the family has offered a lot more um, avenues for advancement and, um, well, just uh, camaraderie than the military did. <laughs> of course, I'm, I'm sure there are some people, and you can see Himalayan's mouth making a sort of like telltale twitch that you recognize as a smile, uh, and they say, uh, I've had a lot more friends here than I ever did in the military, but of course, some people might have a different story to tell. Well, I'm happy for your friendship, either way. You mean very much to me. Now, will you pass me that? <laughs> and they point to uh, a tongue depressor, a, a metal tongue depressor. I grab it. <laughs> okay. Okay. You can see that they're kind of checking. Uh, and then Hamelian will, will make a few more um, questions to the patient. Uh, the patient seems to be complaining of uh, breathing problems and feeling like there's something kind of like lodged in their uh, chest or throat. Okay. And then Hamelian will turn to you and say, I would feel a lot better though if we could discover uh, what ails Selby. I'll be on it. Do you think that you could speak with? Um, and you see Himalayan, uh stop short and say, perhaps we shouldn't bother mother with this errand. Maybe speak with Theodore or Briar. Yes. 
Good. Good. Thank, thank you for your help. Uh, I can take it from here. And Tiago makes his leave. Okay. Um, the ship continues cutting across the waves. Um, you really have reached the point. I mean, it's it's the dead of night, but you've reached the point uh, where there, there's no land visible anywhere. You're really in the middle of the sea uh, and it is disorienting. Um, the moon really is the only bearing. You see it just sort of sitting right there on the horizon with the ship pointing straight toward it. Um, you can kind of look out through portals on the side of the ship or if you're on deck. Um, the, the, the moon is kind of ever present. Even the light is uh, the primary illumination at the moment in the ship. So let us move now to a very, very low chamber in the bilge of the ship. Um, this used to be a storage room uh, where barrels of salt uh, that have been also filled with fish and other um, preserved meat, uh, they've been cleared out of this room and instead there is a small filthy cot. Uh, there is half an empty barrel which is being used as a stool by Theodore. And Theodore, you are in the middle of a task which you have now performed for about 10 days straight as Selby leans over a bucket which you are holding and vomits a absolutely reeking putrescent yellow bile. Her skin uh, looks jaundiced and um, her teeth have been falling out slowly over the last few days. Um, she retches and um, continues the uh, behavior that she has for most of the days that you've been her, basically her primary caretaker, um, which is that she won't talk to you. Um, she looks at you with disdain and she leans back against the head of the bed, uh, feels her empty gums with her tongue and, uh, and just shakes her head and looks up at the ceiling. Um, what would an observer notice about you, Theodore? Um, so Theodore, um, he's dressed in inexpensive clothes. Uh, he makes his living as an explorer and a traveler, and so he doesn't dress in any way that is flashy. Um, I'd say that he's a thin and wiry fellow with uh, his beard and his hair are sort of unkept. These are not things that he necessarily cares for. Um, he appears to be a fine physical specimen for someone who's pushing into their 40s. Um, but if you were to get closer um, and, to an ex and to expect to really inspect him, um, you'd see a tiredness in his eyes, um, a strain on his soul and his very being uh, at this point. Um, very weary uh, of the last few days, uh, the last few months, uh, the last few years, um, all of which have taken a, a significant toll on him. Uh, so you're, you're standing there with the uh, little bucket filled with this bile. And uh, as you've seen many times before, the bile uh, absorbs into the wood that the bucket is made of, turning the entire thing yellow wherever it touched, um, but leaving no trace of actual liquid behind. Um, you handle it with uh, thick leather gloves, like they're probably blacksmith's gloves that were given to you for the task. And um, you stride out of the room, making sure to lock the door behind you. And you take the bucket to the edge of the ship and you throw it overboard. Okay. Uh, it's at that point that you hear mother's voice. Uh, mother is a fairly tall woman, uh, un just under six feet. And uh, she's in her early 70s, um, but broad-shouldered. Uh, she currently has her sleeves rolled up, and she is lugging uh, what looks like some kind of uh, provisions out of a nearby, um, a nearby storage area, uh, remembering that you're in the bilge of the ship. Um, and she says, Ah, Theodore, it's good to see you. How it, uh, is the business in there? I think you know what the business is like, Mother. Have you been in to see her? Yes. Yes, I saw her this morning. 
I'm sorry that this falls to you. You know that there's no one else I can trust. I understand that, but I am worried for her. I am worried that she's not going to make it much longer. How no. are you going to explain this to everyone else? They're already asking so many questions. She approaches you, dropping the, um, the items that she was carrying, and she holds a finger up very close to your face and says, I have everything under control. Just breathe. Trust me. Together, you and I will handle this situation and no one else will need to be concerned about it. I told you before, she is already lost. Your concern will do her no good. Do you hear me? I do, Mother, and I, I apologize. I, I do not mean to question you at all. You know that. You know that I serve you. Perhaps if you could tell me more about what's going on, I could I could be of help. I feel like I feel like I'm pushing around in the dark and I I don't know exactly what it is you need me to do. I mean You're right. You're right. I've kept you too much in the dark, and I'm sorry for that. Come, let's let's talk a little bit. You and I, we can decide what is the um, best way to care for her. And she'll um, take you up into her own cabin, which you can see is pretty well appointed. Um, she has a beautiful quilt on her bed, which you recognize as something that was made for her by the members of the family um, back in Orocos, where you used to live. Uh, and each quilt square is actually woven with a, a particular um, symbol that represents the various members and families, um, and their names are embroidered on each square. Um, but she'll kind of sit you down in a comfortable chair next to her bed, and she sits on the edge of the bed, and she says, Again, I, I, I am sorry that I didn't tell you. I didn't want to, to worry you with more details. But it is a serious situation and you deserve to know. So let me begin by telling you that um, Marsus, whom you know was engaged to Selby, he is a vile, despicable traitor. Information came into Briar's hands that he was planning to not only leave us, but that he was going to sell us out to the authorities. I don't have to tell you what that means. I myself only just barely got out of custody. Uh, another crime to be framed for? It, it couldn't happen. It wasn't possible. And not only this, Marcus had corrupted her. He had started turning her mind. She was beset. You know what it's like when a person begins to wrestle with their what they know is true. They begin to doubt every little thing. They begin to see manipulators behind every action. She accused me of a crime that I won't even mention. And of course it was fabricated, but when your own child accuses you of such a thing. It's impossible to see their eyes and not see that betrayal every time. I know you know what that's like. To look at your troops, your insubordinate followers, and know that they don't believe in you and that nothing you can say will make it better. I do, Mother. I do. Well, it had to be done then. You understand. I didn't want to harm her in any way. I only wanted to show her the truth and confront her with, with the despicable nature of her condition. It did go a little far, and for that I'm sorry, and I'm sorry to have involved you. But you know that I love you. And she kind of holds the back of your head uh, gently with her strong hands and kind of pulls you in for a hug. And Theodore will, will give in to that um, and then sort of 
use that as, as a means of sort of stabilizing himself, collecting himself a bit. Uh, after a moment, pulling back. This crime that she accused you of, I, I had heard nothing of it. Had she told others? No. Marsus had put it into her mind, and I believe she spoke to Briar about it, and it was he that brought it to my attention, and when I spoke to her, she repeated it. it it's meaningless. It has nothing to do with anything. Lies only beget more lies. But I understand that I've put you in a difficult position, so why don't you take the rest of the night off and I'll sit with her? Are there other questions you have for me? Other things I can you set your mind at ease about? No, Mother, I, I, I feel as though I've eaten up enough of your time already. Though I will ask, I know that you asked me not to speak of this with the others. But as I said, they are beginning to ask questions. And I am afraid that, well, I'm afraid that I'll have to, to tell them something at some point. Is this something we intend to keep from them, from the, the rest of the family, for the duration of whatever is afflicting Selby, or, or at some point are we going to reveal this deed that had to be done? Make a persuasion check, if you would. Alrighty. So that's a base of 16, and let's see. Okay, so that would be a dirty 20. Okay, um, she looks downward, kind of uh, grits her teeth a little bit, and she says, if they ask to see her, these people may do so. Briar, Tiago, Himalian. And if they ask for any more information, if anyone suspects that she is afflicted in some way, you tell them that she is sick, deathly sick, and that we are doing our best for her. I understand. Thank you for trusting me. Yes. With that. I will, I'll go sit with her and, and you get some sleep. Okay, and then yeah, Theodore would slowly sort of rise and make his way out of Mother's cabin um, and sort of slowly find his way to his own. Um, yeah. Great. Okay, Adelaide. Um, you're back in your own quarters here. This is, unfortunately, you don't have your own private room. Uh, there are probably a few other uh, uh, folks that have a bunk nearby, maybe a couple hammocks packed in pretty tight, um, but you yourself have been given an actual bed, one of just a few on board. And you are sitting there with your cat, uh, who you know is all ears and ready to hear your troubles. D does your cat have a name? I don't, I don't know. Uh, am <laughs> I, I am aware of who this cat is, yes? Or is this just my cat? Um, you, you probably suspect that this is not just a cat. You know that it's not visible to anyone else, but it's up to you whether male or female, or if you, the cat has not given you a name. So, uh, it's up to you if you call the cat anything. I think it's, uh, uh, ooh, ooh. well, my, my real cat's name is Lux, but we don't have to name it Lux. Um, yeah, let's not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, bad stuff's gonna happen it, to this cat. Foreshadowing. Can it name Silver? <laughs> Silver. Oh, no. Perfect. Okay, Silver is there, listening. Oh, I hate this stupid boat. It's no place for a lady. Um, Silver just sort of nuzzles you, trying to comfort you. I did do the right thing, didn't I? kind of looks up as if to say everything you do is right. I love you. I'm worried that Briar is starting to feel remorse or guilt and I wouldn't want him saying or doing anything that could put the family in danger. Do you think I should do something? 
um, Silver kind of swirls around uh, your back and gives you like a little nudge with uh, her. Is it a she? Um, sure. Okay. She'll give you a little nudge with her snout. Like a uh, same sort of thing when um, she wants you to do something. Did you make that appear on the ship? That ghostly vision of Marsus? Was that a joke? Was Silver that looks at you with doe eyes and just kind of bats them like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, Adelaide pets Silver and scratches her behind the ear. And uh, she says, oh, I suppose it is too late to go about on the boat tonight. But tomorrow, perhaps. Unless, do you know where Selby is? Do you know where they're keeping her? Um, a little twinkle in Silver's eye lights up, and Silver right away bounces onto the floor and starts pawing at the cabin door. And Adelaide will get up and put on her slippers and put on her little, like, uh, house, house coat, boat coat, uh, and is going to grab a lantern and follow Silver. Okay. You slowly work your way down, 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 uh, two full decks down into the bilge of the ship, uh, where you can see the door of a room is uh, shut on the on the aft side of the ship. And uh, it seems to be locked, but there is a lantern light coming from underneath. And you can faintly hear Mother's voice speaking. Adelaide would like to go up to the door and press her hair up against it and see what she can hear. Okay. Uh, go ahead and make a perception check. I rolled an 11 plus oh, character sheet. Uh, plus 3. Okay, 14. 14. Um, you hear mother. Uh, at first, she's singing a lullaby something that you would recognize. Um, she probably has sung in your presence before. Um, and then you hear what sounds like the swish of water in a bucket and the, the drip of a rag being wrung out. And she says, my dear, the little things that we do one by one take you down to your grave every breath another step toward death and damnation are you there yet have you reached it uh adelaide's going to knock on the door <laughs> you catch you catch mother part way through that sentence have you reached it and she stops short uh you hear the rag drop into the bucket and then she clop 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 walks in her sturdy uh you know half inch heels not much uh over to the door and uh just cracks it open about four inches just enough that you can see her face lit in the light of your lantern from below and maybe not for the first time but certainly in this moment mother has a very malevolent cast to her face and she says, Adelaide. I, I was worried about Selby, and I wanted, I wanted to see if she was doing all right. Is she in there? Who? Hi. Yes, she's in here. She's all right. May I speak with her? She won't speak to anyone. She's refusing. She's refusing to eat. She's refusing to speak. She's very, very ill, and I'm very concerned for her. Is this because of Mar Marsis? Or... Of course, of course. Some reaction, some emotional hysteria she's under from having her engagement broken off, no doubt. And nothing more? Why don't you be the judge? And she suddenly, and maybe surprisingly, uh, throws the door open, and you can see in the room the uh, pretty soiled uh, bedding on which uh, Selby is resting, 
Um, she's now lying down, so her head's on the pillow. Um, she's mostly covered with blankets. Um, but you know that thing where you see an object and you think it's a person, uh, like in the dark? You actually have kind of the reverse of that, where you see something on the bed and you, th you think, surely this is like a wooden mannequin. And then, and then you realize, of course, that it's, it's Selby. She's actually there, a person, alive, breathing. Um, her face is like the texture of cheese that's been sitting out in the dry sun. Um, and she looks uh, deathly ill. It's the, the yellow complexion that she has, that kind of jaundice, it's like a mustard color. And it's, it's almost a glow. Um, and Mother steps away from the door and lets you enter. Uh, Adelaide does not enter at first and then realizes that she probably should and takes a few tentative steps inside. She takes out her handkerchief and uses it to cover her nose to protect it from any smells that might be in this room right now. Yes, uh, the smell's pretty, pretty rank. Um, you can see an empty wooden bucket small, just about uh, eight inches in diameter, just resting next to the bed. Um, and Mother says, well, I hope you're pleased to you. Why would I be pleased? She looks horrible. Of course. Isn't that what you intended? No, what, why would you, what do you mean? My dear, I am not unaware of what goes on in the family. I know how much you wanted the attention of young Marsus. And I know how distraught you must be that he has left us. But I also know that those are the sorts of things we hold down. We don't act on them, do we, dear? Of course not. You are going to succeed me. I've told you this. The family will rely on you one day. We hopefully have some time before that will come to be. But you must learn to be strong. You must put envy away. Anything. <laughs> um. You notice Silver now uh, scurry into the room and get up onto a nightstand, looking down almost right at Selby's face. Um, Mother, of course, does not seem to notice. And um, she seems really fixated on you, like she's reading your expression. Um, do, is there anything you're at the moment trying to hide or maybe a particular uh, uh, impression you'd like to give off with your response? Adelaide is just trying to keep a straight face, uh, an innocent expression. Um, she might be absentmindedly like fiddling with her necklace, just uh, nervously. Uh. Okay. Um, would you make then your choice of a uh, deception or performance check? I'll choose performance. I rolled another 11, uh, 17. Okay, great. Um, mother seems to sort of uh, take in your demeanor and says, well, I'm sorry if that came across a little harsh. I do love you. And she kind of leans in and, and kisses you on the forehead. And uh, it's at this moment that Tiago has made his way. Having heard that mother was somewhere down uh, below decks, you followed the sound of her voice uh, into this area and you appear in the doorway. And you see uh, the same situation with Selby. She looks deathly ill. Her complexion is miserable and uh, very unhealthy. Pardon me, I do not mean to interrupt. Um, yes, Tiago. Uh, Tiago's kind of staring at Selby um, it's hard to take his eyes off of her. I, um, I, I, I came to, to, uh, see what I could be, be of any use, um, in, in helping with, 
could still be. Yes, yes, of course, of course. We don't know how much longer she has. Perhaps you would like to perform some last rite for her? Yes, I can do this. Um, Himalayan was, they were wondering if, um, is, is she really that far gone? I'm afraid so. We don't know how much longer she has. She won't speak. Tiago looks over to Adelaide just to kind of take in maybe why she's here. <laughs> I am more than happy to sit with you, Tiago, and pray for her. She was my best friend. Yes. Um, gladly. I'm sure that would do her much good. Um, um, Mother will take the opportunity to step outside the room. You notice her, though, fixing an eye on both of you um, as she leaves, and then she'll just slowly close the door. And you hear her leave the key in the lock, but not lock it. Okay. Um, Tiago will uh, kneel down next to the bed. Um, does Selby... I mean, is she making any noise? Is she moving? Yeah, she's breathing. You can hear a bit of a... <gasps> as okay. She's trying to uh, stay conscious. Her eyes are mostly closed, but you don't get the impression that she's actually asleep or passed out. Okay. Adelaide will sit near Tiago and Selby, but not quite as close to the bed. Okay. Adelaide. <clears throat> yes. You've heard me speak about Umhasa. Yes. Close your eyes. I want you to think. I want you to imagine the life beyond this one. The life that awaits Selby. Umasa, we pray that you take our friend, our sister, into your loving arms, that she is worthy of being awoken by you from this dream I think he continues in that vein <laughs> great beautiful thank you um, meanwhile Briar what are you uh, doing about the ship at this time of night when when they brought Sylvia aboard we don't know her I didn't know where she was do I know where her belongings are uh, no, they, presumably they would have been brought on board and, and kept with her yes. or not brought at all, depending on <laughs> the situation. Yes. Um, I imagine he paces for a bit looking for them, um, you know, seeing if he can find a, you know, a, a cabin or somewhere where it might have been stored or asking around maybe. Some sure. The... Make, make a, your choice of an investigation or perception check. Right. Um, yeah, I'll go with... Uh... I'll go with investigation. Ah, oh, they're, they're the same. Yeah, that's a three. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, uh, you look around and you swear you've looked uh, everywhere other than the cargo hold of the ship, and you think, why on earth would she be down in the cargo hold? Um, the, but maybe the thought occurs to you uh, that that's a possibility, um, but you haven't found anything yet. As you're pacing around, um, you enter an area where uh, you know most of the sailors sleep. Um, mm. And this is packed at least three times as densely as the family's quarters. Uh, the sailors really are just all sleeping on these three-tiered racks of hammocks. Mm. Um, smells pretty ripe in here, even only sure. after three or five days or whatever it's been. Mm. Um, but as you uh, walk in, you see that there are a number of them asleep. Uh, those who aren't on the night uh, shift. 
watch. Yeah. Um, you're poking around, maybe in a back corner, seeing if it's possible that she's been stowed somewhere in here, mm -hmm. asleep. And um, you don't see any doors leading out of this area other than the one that you entered. But suddenly, as you turn around, in a flash, you see the face of Marsus right in front of you. And his eyes are red, and he's staring at you. And around his neck is um, the very article of clothing or a cloth or whatever it was that you used to restrain him while you killed him. And uh, for a moment, his mouth opens and out of it fly a number of uh, insects and they buzz around causing you to kind of, uh, you know, clear the air in front of your face. And I need you to make a wisdom saving throw. All right. It's a 10. Okay, you feel a tingle enter your body, beginning with the mouth, spreading across your face, all the way down through your shoulders and chest to the tips of your toes. And you feel that Marsus is within you at this moment. Um, you have the impression of being walked step by step out of the area where the sailors sleep, up to the top deck of the ship, and you feel yourself begin to climb the rigging. As you do, you hear a couple people shout up at you, um, but you have no ability to turn your attention to them. And you are climbing, climbing, climbing up to the crow's nest. Uh, you know that there would be someone stationed up at the crow's nest. Um, and so uh, you maybe <laughs> bide your time for the moment when this person realizes that someone's climbing up. Um, and as you do, uh, your breath is short. Uh, you feel just all of your muscles tensing, begin to ache from, uh, from contracting. Mm -hmm. Any any particular thing you'd like to attempt? You know, you don't have, <laughs> you don't yeah, have. Yeah, uh... I don't have full control. Um, right, right. But you have some control. You could exert yourself to regain control. Yes. Um... So I, have I reached the crow's nest yet, or am I below Not quite. where? Uh, okay. But you, we can also cut ahead to when you've reached it. It's up to you. Sure, sure. No, I um. Uh, what I want to do is, as I'm reaching the crow's nest, I think you know whatever is inside me wants to get into a position. I assume where I can subdue whoever's in the crow's nest, or like make sure that they don't stop me from whatever I'm about to do. What I'm going to try and do is just slam my fist against the bottom of the crow's nest to warn the person that I am coming. Um, yeah, that's what that's what I'm gonna try to do. I don't know if I can okay, great. Uh, successfully do it. Um, make a uh, make an athletics check as you okay. exert your body to uh, get a hold of itself. Yeah, that's a twenty-one. Okay, you manage to uh, pull yourself into control, and mm -hmm. you not only are able to slam on the bottom of the crow's nest, funk. Uh, and startling, seemingly startling from sleep, the person who is up there. Um, and uh, he says, oh, oh, what is it? And you now have uh, control of your body as you as you dangle there, holding on to the rigging. Uh -huh. um, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, in a sort of confused, maybe somewhat like drunken, like faux drunken voice here, <laughs> I thought I saw a storm coming, uh, cl some clouds in that direction. Uh, thought you should pay attention. Yeah. Well, leave my business to me, you drunken fool. And you see the head kind of look over the crow's nest down at you uh, and realize that you're who you are and say, oh, I'm very sorry. Very sorry, sir. I didn't mean it. Oh, it's, a... it's all right. You're right. You do your work. I. Can I I'm... do anything for you? I No, I... No, I... Nothing at all. I... If you've got a, and I look down and and you know my my vision blurs with vertigo as this is way higher than I'm used to. So I'm like, if you maybe had a bit of rope for me, I usually don't climb this high. Sure, sir. Sure. I I'm so sorry, sir. And he'll kind of pull out uh, a coil and uh, let it down so that you can, and, and do, do you want him to like tie you to the rope for security if, or? Yeah, if he could sort of belay me, you know, yeah, from above. Yeah, great. Weirdly, yeah. He can and, do uh, that. 
Oh. And he says, he says, good luck, sir. Take it easy on the drink there. Thank you. And I, I, I certainly shall. I'm just not used to boats. Uh, and okay. he's going to start descending down the Yeah, the you make it to the bottom, back onto the deck. Uh, not exactly solid ground, but better than no. you just were. Yeah, still not. Um, again, you look at the moon, and you have, uh, speaking of vertigo, if you've seen the movie, that that racked focus effect mm, of yeah. the moon seeming to grow even as it's fleeing away from your vision. Um, mm. And uh, at that point, you can go about whatever other... If you, yeah, I'd if, like if to do one thing. To you, oh, yeah, go ahead, please. No, no, I, I would just like to... I'd like to go to my cabin, wherever it is. I assume that I have, I mean, I don't know if I have a mirror there or like a glass, you know, I'm, I'm sure that mirrors would be too expensive to install on every cabin, but whether whatever I have, I want to inspect the places that I felt that thing enter me and just see what I can see, if anything. Mm -hmm. um, you don't get very far because there's a knock on the door and mm -hmm. you hear Theodore's voice behind it. Uh, but look, just from a quick glance, you don't see any sign of injury. Okay. And Theodore, um, what are you saying? Briar, is everything all right in there? Of course it is. What do you need? And I'm going to run over and we'll walk over, sort of stomp over and <laughs> pull, pull open the latch. What is it? What's going on? What just happened out on the deck? Are you sure you're all right? I'm fine. I, th I think simply being... Out at sea is irregular. I had something to drink and found myself climbing up. I made a bet with one of the sailors to, that I could climb higher on the thing that he said I could. So he called me coward. That's all. So Theodore is going to like push past Briar and make his way into whatever space Great. Um, and just sort of assume that he has a place there uh, without yeah. invitation. Um, and I assume I'll... my cabin, sorry, I just, I assume my cabin is. You would think that it would be better appointed. Yes, given yes. My as, in the family. as mother's eldest son, <laughs> literal son, uh, yes, mm -hmm. you, you have the yeah, best. You'd think it would be better, than... but it's actually not that great, like comparatively. <laughs> you know, the, the sheets are a bit ratty, and, um, you know, I've sort of settled for something, it's clear. But yeah, you, you, you come in, and, you know, maybe there's an armchair or something, whatever, whatever you want to do. Okay. Well, I, what I would ask is, um, I, like, not knowing for sure, uh, does Briar drink? Um, he does occasionally it, okay. it this kind of behavior him ex that explanation is pretty bs uh, oh for not... sure i was <laughs> yeah. curious as to whether or not there was any liquor that would be about the cabin that i would then help <laughs> myself to as i walked in um uh, and just yeah. sort of <laughs> yeah yeah sure yeah there would be some it would, yeah yeah i love that <laughs> that's great so yeah theodore immediately walks past um and and with a uh, with this like sort of air of authority about him is like Whatever reason you have for running around on the deck like that, I know you don't have a whole lot of experience out on the seas, but I can tell you that sailors are quite the superstitious group. And behavior like that, well, depending on, on what sort of trials and tribulations we have in front of us, it could have a negative impact. And so you might want to keep those sort of outbursts to yourself. That's, that's all I'm saying. Right. Well, uh, the next time I decide to climb the rigging, I'll make sure to do it when the ship's completely empty, as you suggest. Thank you. <laughs> right. Right. So, I know that these last few days have been particularly rough on all of you. Have you managed to find your sea legs yet? I've been managing. I'm sure you have more expertise than and me, I, uh, and luckily I haven't had as much to do. What has Mother had you doing now? There were some things that she needed attended to. Um, it was nothing, nothing too crazy. Uh, just making sure that things were in order so that whenever we arrive, um, that we'll be able to, we'll be able to smoothly transition into whatever comes next. And with that, down whatever alcohol uh, Theodore has in his hand. <laughs> That's great. Well, 
If it's for, uh, if it's of the family's next steps, then I'm glad you're doing it. I... <sighs> that was some bloody business back in Orokos. Um, you what wouldn't is... happen... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Please. No, it's, it's simply that I, I have not been with the family nearly as long as you, so this was my my first experience with that that sort of thing. Not that I haven't seen bloodshed before in some measure. I, of course, have seen all sorts of combat in my travels, but but to your point, that was that was a lot. And I'll admit, though, that though I've been with the family my with mother my entire life, that was strange even for me, that crowd rushing the compounds and I the last time that we moved was I was a boy uh, so it's strange to leave all that behind well change can be good new beginnings and all of that um, I for one can't wait to see uh, what there is for us at the other end of this journey I've uh, been waiting for an opportunity like this. Well, it feels like my entire life, so. <laughs> you are a, a great optimist. I'm sure that is a, one of the many good qualities that Mother admires about you. I, I, if you wouldn't mind me asking, I, I'm sure you're not involved in this, but have you heard anything about what happened to Selby or where she might be? And with that, Theodore will pause and, and take a seat wherever in the, in the cabin there is to, to mm -hmm. take one um, and sort of hang his head a bit. I talked to mother and, and she told me it was all right to, to share with you if you asked, which you have. Yes. I have. There's something wrong with Selby. And I... I've seen a lot of things, Briar, but I... I haven't seen anything like this before. But it was necessary. That much, I can assure you. Mother has told me it was necessary. And we are right to put our trust in her. What was necessary? Did she become she's ill? Being kept, she's being kept down, down in the cargo holds, down in the bilge. You should go see for yourself. I think, I think that would be best. Mother, mother may still be down there. I, I don't know. She, she's asked me to, to take care of Selby, and I have been been doing my 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 very very best to do that. And then tonight she, she gave me a bit of respite, and, and I will take it. And, and therefore I, <clears throat> I will steer clear, of Selby's quarters until until next. I am ordered to to attend to her. But if you wish to see more, if you wish to, to have these questions answered, then I, I would recommend that you, as I said, go see for yourself, Briar. Where? And with that, um, Theodore will map out as, as best he can specific directions on how to get down to Selby's quarters or where they're holding Selby. Uh, Briar will then immediately say, there's another, another bottle in there. And he'll point to his suitcase and leave. And Theodore would absolutely help himself <laughs> to it. <laughs> okay, excellent. So uh, as Briar heads down, um, we bring ourselves back to where Adelaide and Tiago are at the best side of Selby. Um, you have uh, read a prayer over her and finished. Uh, is there anything else you wanted to do? Um, could I just inspect her? 
for my own yeah, personal. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not gonna like physically try to like. I mean, I'm not sure if there's any kind of like contagion. Uh, you know, Tiago doesn't really know about anything like that, and so I think just visually trying to get a sense of what happened. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, are you proficient with medicine? I am. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and make a medicine check. Woohoo. This is great. You probably picked this up doing rounds with Himalayan. Yeah. Uh, well, a six plus five, 11. Hey, not bad. Okay, so uh, with an 11, you can determine um, that she very clearly has suffered from blood loss. Um, however, the jaundice doesn't seem to have any explanation that's readily apparent to you. So um, the color that she, that she, her complexion has taken um, seems strange and not really in keeping with the other symptoms. You can't, you can't right away put a finger on what that would be. Um, but the other symptoms, she's clearly uh, has a fever, she's lost blood, um, she is, uh, she's in a very deep state of, uh, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, like she, she, she's almost in a trance. She's hardly conscious. Okay. Catatonic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, probably not that extreme, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the, and, and you, you don't see wounds that would explain the blood loss. Um, you know that there are some uh, diseases or conditions that could cause, um, that could cause uh, the blood to either, you know, be infected or something like that. Um, and so you, you think maybe it's something like that, but it doesn't explain everything. Um, and as you're making that check, suddenly she begins to dry heave as though she's going to vomit. Uh, you notice there's a bucket conveniently by the bedside um, I'll grab it and kind of go over towards her head. Okay. Her hair falls forward uh, almost into the bile that she begins vomiting into the bucket. Adelaide will hold her hair. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so you manage to pull that back. As you do, you notice along her uh, hairline on her scalp um, that the skin is peeling badly as though it's just dying right <sighs> off of her head. Disgusting. Uh, and it's this scene that Briar walks in on as he finds his way into the bilge. Uh, he freezes at the at the entrance and just sort of watches it. Of course, you know, immediately thinks, oh, what can I do to help? Looks around for another bucket, but I mean, they're dealing with it and just watches. It's... Okay. Briar, you don't, you don't want to see this. You don't want to see her like this. Well, too late for that, I think. I need to you know, step in. Uh, what is what is this? As she as she as she finished, is this still happening? I mean, how, how long? Yeah, does it last? She, she, there'll be a, a bit of a lull after a, a minute. She's still here now. What we um, we I, prayed for her. We prayed for her. What kind of prayer? A prayer of passing. She's not passing. She's not going to die. Nothing happened. Nothing Nothing to, to, to cause this. this. This makes no sense at all. And he's going to go in and, and, and observe her and try to, like, look into her eyes and see if he can... see if she's there, see if he can communicate with her. Okay. Um, what kind of check would you like to make? Some kind of charisma-based check, I would assume, right? Uh, well... Uh, narratively, yes. I would love to do that here. <laughs> Not a <as> strong suit? <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd, I'd prefer an investigation if possible, just to kind of get a sense of her. But yeah, if you, if you investigation want... would give you information about her I want to connect. With, I want to connect with her. Yeah, I'll try a charisma check. Okay. You know, you can roll um, as it, with advantage because okay. you are, as we've discussed, very, very close with her. Yeah, yeah, I know her. Okay, that's an 11. A lot of 11s tonight, guys. <laughs> okay, um, you don't fully jog, uh, jar her into consciousness. Wakefulness, yeah. But you see her eyes connect with yours. And um, 
for a moment, they look at you with uh, revulsion. And um, she, she kind of blinks a bit. And through this, this almost crusty yellow skin on her face, she says, Briar. Sylvie, you're going to be okay. What's Everything's going to be fine. To me? I, 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 I don't know, but you need to. You need, you need to hold on. We're going to find whatever we need to to make sure that you're okay. We just, just hold, hold on. Stay with us. Have we been giving her water? Uh, I, 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 no, no. She, she yeah, she would. Sleep. She wouldn't have been taking any water, even if there were some. Uh, she seems um, to she... be in so much pain, Briar. Suddenly, um, Selby, uh, continuing to look at Briar, says, I love you, Marcus. Dear Marcus. Oh, Selby. No, I'm no, darling, so no. I'm so sorry. They did this. To you. Don't think about that. Don't think about him now, darling. Who is Marcus? Is this? Her fiance, the one who. Oh. She holds a finger very weakly, but reaches Briar's face and strokes his cheekbone um, familiarly uh, in, in a different way than she would with Briar. Um, and she she looks at you kind of suddenly knowingly um, knowingly is not the right word uh, sh she looks at you as a lover would look at someone and and says I love you so much we 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 love you too Selby we are we're here for you. As you say we, she starts to look slowly around the room, catches the eye of each person, and her gaze lingers at Adelaide. And Adelaide, you feel her not only looking you in the eye, but looking down at the pendant around your neck of the cat. And Darling? she says, Yeah. In this. No, no, darling, no. It... Uh, Adelaide's gonna let go of her hair and take a step back. She hair falls over she's... her face, giving her uh, an even more ghoulish cast. She's she's confused. She doesn't she doesn't know what she's saying. Um, she you doesn't see, know who we are. You see, tears begin to stream out of her eyes, and she says. I'll never forget. I hate you. I I should get mother. And Tiago's going yes. to uh, dash out of as, the As as uh, Tiago leaves the room, suddenly you notice something coming out of her mouth, which is uh, at first you smell it. It smells like wood smoke. And uh, then you can see that there is a dark gray vapor escaping her mouth with the shallow exhalations that she's making. And in her eyes is um, a reflection of orange flame uh, that kind of blends in a bit with the yellow uh, texture on her face. And she says, you're all going to hell. And then her head, beginning with her eyes, catches on fire and begins to blaze suddenly and out of control. And her head burns in front of you. Her hair begins to uh, curl back and uh, burn into nothing. The flesh uh, begins to stink even more. And after maybe a minute, can uh, we look for a bucket of water? Sure. 
I would sure, love yeah. a bucket of water. Uh, so so the closest thing that would uh, the closest thing you see Adelaide is a water skin or like a maybe a glass jug. I grab it, but then I put it out for one of the men to take. But, I think Briar, before before the bucket is retrieved, is going to reach out and place his hands on her head as if trying to smother the fire with his own hands. Okay. Yeah. Um, make make a uh, survival check, Briar. All right. Oh, yeah. Bad. Bad eight. <laughs> it's an eight. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you take seven fire damage oh. as your, your hands begin burning in the flame you're trying to put out and you feel um, not to go into too much detail here, you feel pieces of her burning onto your fingers. Oh. Yeah, and you know, and and feeling it, you know, he's gonna hold on for as long as he can, you know, taking all that, and then and, and it's just gonna get a pull off as the bucket gets close. We'll probably reach out uh, with a burn, unless Tiago's got it. Um, um, Tiago is praying and hold, gripping his holy symbol as he uh, reaches out, and I, you know, uh, gonna cast. He's saying, "Wait, I had a thing for this." <laughs> Oh, yeah, he nice. says, you would uh, think for this moment. <laughs> <laughs> In case of head flame. He says, uh, uh, he, he just reaches out and gets as close to her as possible. It's a cure wound, so I suppose I have to touch her. I'm going to try to touch her shoulder, maybe. Um, okay. And just uh, and, and say, uh, her, her blessings be upon you, her blessings be upon you, her blessings be upon you. Um, trying to cast cure wounds. The best okay, I got. Make, make an initiative. Uh, roll. So this would be just a straight dexterity check, but any bonus you have to initiative would apply. Um, 15. Okay. Uh, as you say this blessing and you touch her shoulder, you feel the virtue of uh, your deity. Leave your fingers, enter her body, and you believe that you have saved her life. And it's at that moment that the uh, jug of water. Uh, so did someone take it from Adelaide? I'll just, yes. I'll just, okay, did you, did you yeah, take Yeah, I grabbed it with my burned hand and yeah. <laughs> onto her. Okay, <laughs> water showers over her head, steam rising up, and you see an absolutely ghastly sight that is left behind. Oh, God. She is alive, um, but that's about all you can say. Uh, Adelaide is going to fall to her knees, and uh, I think that she holds her hands together, and it looks like she's praying. And I think what happens is everybody hears a loud bell, even though there's no bell. Maybe there's a bell on the ship. Maybe it sounds sure. like that. Absolutely, a belaying, uh, yes. like a signal. Um, and I'm going to cast Toll, uh, toll the Dead. On her? on her, <laughs> with, with with the with the attempt to, without my friends noticing, put her out of her misery. Sure, yeah. I think that your spell casting would be arcane enough to anyone present, and they wouldn't suspect it. So no need uh, to right, hide the spell. No yeah, yeah okay. you can just do it. So she'll make a saving throw. Spell save DC fourteen. Okay, she fails. Um, she has taken damage, so you'll do 1d12 necrotic damage. Oh, oh, I've got to find the, the die that has 12 sides on it. Graham, you're throwing me <laughs> Um, That's an 11. Okay. You all hear the bell on the ship tolling uh, as of a signal, either for some kind of uh, like labor coordination or um, in this particular instance, it is ringing a very clear three whole uh, rhythm that signals uh, another ship approaching. And that bell symbolically also is the death knell for Selby as her breathing gets shallow and then she exhales her last breath and becomes nothing but a terribly burned corpse. What was that? <sighs> Tiago, what happened? <sighs> I think... She's, um... She's 
she has woke up. Briar is going to come close to her and spend probably more than a, you know, maybe a minute trying to verify that she is still alive. He's going to be hold, holding her hand, looking for a pulse. Um, he probably wouldn't attempt mouth to mouth because that's obviously, you know, that's not the thing for heads on fire. Um, but uh, he, you know, he's, he's going to you know, <laughs> sit there and try to uh, try to find some way for this to not be the case. And, yeah. and when it's done, and when it's done, he will slam his fist against the side of the bed. You know, the bed breaks, not like it, it, in a massive way, but you, you yes. see the headboard crack, just split all the way across as Briar slams his enormous fist into it. Natalie's going to rush forward and try to pull him away. And he's he's gonna he's gonna let it happen. He's gonna you know he's he's gotten that anchor out at least for the moment. He's gonna. Pull we back. need to tell Slow. mother. We need to tell her that Selby has passed and and that it is done and. We just, we should leave. Tiago, Tiago will know how to take care of her now. At this moment, uh, Theodore, are you still in Briar's chamber drinking? <laughs> it's uh, been, been five, ten minutes. I mean, I, I would have been for a bit, um, and then would have made my way out. Um, and so, yeah. Okay, I making your way have... out, okay, you can see that on the, uh, the first... A hold of the ship, so just below the main deck, um, there is quite a stir that has started. Um, you see probably six of the sailors are currently holding together um, a figure who you recognize as Coranus. Coranus is um, the agent of the family. He's kind of the, the fixer, the one who um, similar to what Theodore has <laughs> experienced at the beginning of this session, uh, done a lot of the, what you would guess is dirty work, and, and no one ever wants to know the stuff that Karanis is up to. Mm -hmm. um, he is currently being held by six sailors, uh, men and women, um, strong figures kind of holding him in place. He's gagged, and his wrists are tied behind his back, and uh, a couple of them have small swords drawn, and they are uh, shouting, and you can actually see Mother is n nearby where you're coming down the stairs. And she is holding her hands out and says, um, she says, just don't hurt him. We can discuss this. And the sailors are in, in a rage um, saying, we want to know where we're going. And you hear uh, one, of the, one of the women say, we're on this voyage too. It's best that we be told. What does Theodore do? Okay. Um, unfortunately, uh, I would say that Theodore has found himself in this situation perhaps a time or two before. And so sort of looks to mother, uh, perhaps makes eye contact with her and then looks over and decides to take it upon himself to sort of rectify and calm the situation and sort of confidently strolls across the deck um, especially bolstered by the few draws that he may have had from Briar's alcohol just a few minutes <laughs> prior, um, and and addressing whomever he would, uh, whoever seems to be in charge of what is unfolding, um, uh, looks across and says, "All right, <clears throat> so I want you to tell me exactly how do you think this is going to end." Um, the woman who was speaking says, well, we know one thing. We know we're not headed to Ordesos. We saw the captain's bearing. And uh, back in a, a dim corner of this deck, you can see the captain. Um, Zarik. Mm -hmm. Sorry. The captain is Tariq Zet. And he... Uh, he looks at you with a look of remorse, but um, utter inability to deal with the situation. He's just kind of slouching in a hammock uh, back there as though uh, kind of looking guiltily toward the situation that he may have accidentally caused. Um, and mm -hmm. the woman says, we know the bearings. We're not stupid. We're not heading to our death house. So just tell us where we're going and maybe we'll be happy to go there. But we need to know. Well, 
before we can get to any sort of conversation that might unfold, it would appear as though you have taken another member of this family hostage, and you are acting in a very irrational, violent, and hostile way. And if you want answers, if you want to have a conversation with me or the captain or mother, well, this isn't the way to do it now, is it? We haven't gotten any answers otherwise. We've only been on this ship for how many days now? Three days, three days. It's been you... four, you fool. I think Theodore will sort of compose himself. You know what I mean, woman. We left a stressful situation. We were attacked, our family was attacked. We didn't have time to do this as we had initially planned. You know that. You all have put your faith in this family. And it takes four days, four days for that faith to crumble, to fall away. We signed on to sail to Ardessos. Now we ain't going to Ardessos. So we, where are we going? We have taken a detour is all that it is. We have the ability to determine whether or not weather or other vessels may or may not be tracking us. What if those from, from the city have followed us? Would it make sense to, to follow along the straightest, most direct path to our destination? Or would it make sense to perhaps evade pursuit to some measure? So uh, despite the fact that Theodore doesn't actually, hadn't realized that right. <laughs> that you were not heading to Ardessos, this is a, a great response. So please make a, uh, your choice, deception, or I could buy persuasion because, you know, even if the facts aren't quite right, the, the spirit of what you're saying is a spirit of calm and, and persuasion. So make it with advantage. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's... Go ahead. I just want to say, as this conversation is happening, uh, the rest of you hear shouts coming from above. Okay. And and Theodore, you would also oh, no. hear the tolling of the warning bell. So that would be a, a uh, five plus three, so for a total of eight. Okay. Um, the, the woman kind of gestures at the other uh, sailors and they throttle him over the head with a belaying pin and throw him to the ground, and they all draw weapons and advance toward you. Um, the other members of the family who are here and shouting support in support of you, um, they kind of back off and clearly don't want to be involved in the fight. Um, mother looks to you to protect her, and the rest of you, having heard these uh, cries, have an opportunity to respond. What would you like to do? We, are, we have heard these from some distance. Yeah, you're probably uh, two decks below. What's happening upstairs? It does not sound good. I don't want to leave her like this. Uh, Adelaide moves you're... to put a blanket over Selby. You have the key, I... don't you? I do not. Uh, oh, it's in the, it's the key in the was in the door. Yeah. Um, by the way, Adelaide, as you move in to put the blanket over her, you put the blanket over her. You notice that there's no bile in the bucket that she vomited. In fact, the whole bucket seems to be this sickly yellow color. Okay. Um, I think we might want to dispose of this. Uh, and Adelaide is going to use her handkerchief to pick up the bucket so she doesn't have to touch it directly. Sure. I believe it's, 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 uh, well, if this is catching, we don't want, we don't want this on board the ship, do we? Uh, yes. Briar, would you, would you, please? Sure. Uh, you could grab some of the the sheet or whatever. I mean, something to, to hold it so it's not directly in his hands, and he just goes and tosses it out the porthole and storms out the door to go up upstairs to whatever chaos is happening. Out the portal, you can see there is another ship um, that is quickly advancing. Uh, let me say this. Um, it is, it is not weighed anchor, However, there is no one on board from what you can see. It looks like an empty vessel, so it's probably drifting. So saying that it's advancing might be a, 
a misstatement. We're it's, coming closer to it. it. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. You're getting close to it, and it is just listing and moving with the current. And this is seemingly what that uh, warning bell signaled. Um, and then were the rest of you heading upstairs? Yeah. Uh, I'll... yes. Adelaide was going to be the last out the door. Sure, sure. So uh, why don't we roll initiative? And we'll make an order here. And then uh, we'll have Theodore will be the only, Theodore and these uh, mutineers will be the only two to act on the first round. Then the second round, we can add in uh, Tiago and Briar. Uh, and on that second round, Adelaide can do anything she might want to in the room before leaving. And then uh, you can join on the third round. Cool. So did anyone roll over 20? Okay, anyone over 15? Or 10? Oh, no. Yeah. Okay, who That's rolled right. the lowest? <laughs> I rolled a 9. Okay. I had an 8. I got a, I got a 6. And I got a natural 1 total of <laughs> 4. Amazing. Oh, I guess okay. I technically got a seven, but that doesn't make a big difference. Well, I guess then our Mutineers uh, 20 initiative is overkill. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> All right. Um, so they spring forward at Theodore, and they are going to swing with their weapons. Um, there are six of them, um, but they can't all get to you based on your positioning, so only three of them are able to attack this round. Okay. Uh, and, and what's your armor class? Uh, that would be 15. 15, okay. So um, two of them uh, slash at you and you you were able to parry with, uh, do you have a weapon that you've drawn, I'm guessing? Yes, I would have had it on me and if I'd had the opportunity to draw it the second yeah. they started to move aggressively, then I, yeah. Sure. And what is that weapon? Uh, it's a long sword. Great, so you draw your longsword just with enough time to clang, clang, parry two sword blows. And then the third catches you, cutting on the underside of your forearm. And you are going to take four slashing damage. Okay. And then it is your turn. Okay. Um, let's see. So, Realizing that things have quickly escalated beyond his ability to contain, um, Theodore will um, like slash in a wide arc uh, in an attempt to to both press them away, but potentially catch who that whoever is standing closest to him um, before. Uh, making like retreating to put himself between mother and the and the mutineers so um with that first sort of uh wild swing that is a 17 plus four to hit so that'll be a 21. okay yeah and then that'll be a d8 plus four slashing damage so that'll be seven total as he sort of again sort of swings recklessly uh and then begins to to retreat backwards not not like turning his back to them but kind of you know at a steady pace backwards so okay so you slash across the chest of the person who had gotten the hit in on you mm -hmm. and um you see them clutch the bloody shirt and stumble backward um presumably leaving the fight okay all right so then they're going to have an opportunity to attack one more time. And this time, uh, two more of them will advance and get to you. So there's going to be a total of four attacks because the one who you damaged will not be attacking. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first two Ooh. miss. Um, you managed to do a little bit of sword play and uh, keep them back. Then uh, the next two will hit. So uh, you're going to take three slashing damage from one of those hits and four from the other. So you've now taken seven this turn. And, and how much was it last turn? 
Uh, I believe four, so that should put me, like, my HP is 10, so. Okay. Ooh. So that takes me out. All right, so uh, they're not intending to kill you. They're intending to subdue you. So um, one of them will cut you again, this time across the shoulder, and um, the third one who actually gets a hit will um, hit you across the face with the pummel of their sword. And as you drop down unconscious, you feel them grabbing uh, at your body and beginning to restrain you. Mother is shouting uh, commands, telling them to to cease, but seemingly to no avail. Uh, so at this point, um, Adelaide, you're the last one in the room. What would you like to do? Silver, are you there? Silver kind of curls up against you, having appeared almost out of nowhere. What was that? What happened? Do you know what that was? Um, she looks at you long and intensely in the eyes, as if to say, um, you know what you got yourself into when we struck our bargain. Adelaide is going to walk over to the, uh, what was Selby, and she's going to say, I'm not afraid of you. And then she's going to storm out of the room and slam the door behind her. From behind you, as you say, I'm not afraid of you, you hear a voice say, she is not afraid of you. And you turn and you just see Silver there looking at you with a look of confident support. I give and Silver Sil a scratch on the head. <laughs> Silver says, what else? Uh, protection? I need your help. I can grant that. Good. And more. Look oh. into my eyes. Uh, Adelaide is a little nervous, but she does so, because she's curious and intrigued. Uh, but Silver's eyes gleam and in the reflection, you can see what looks like a burning ship. And you see what you think is the moon or the sun, it's not clear. Um, it is gleaming yellow with that same color, jaundiced color that was on Selby's face. And you hear again the voice say, what do you see? Uh, the moon and a burning ship. Um, is that our ship? You will know when these things shall come to pass. You will see. You will see the realm of the Hyorak! And then suddenly you startle as you have gone up the stairs and you are now standing in the middle of the conflict, not aware um, of how you got here, but Presumably it's just minutes or moments later as um, these sailors are currently um, throttling Theodore and holding him down as they attempt to tie him. A couple of them are still uh, holding out weapons to anyone else who might approach. And it's at that point that uh, Theodore, um, you don't need to make a death saving throw, um, but I am gonna have you make a constitution saving uh. throw. Okay. okay. I rolled a four. Okay, you remain unconscious from that blow. Um, and it is Briar's turn. You have reached uh, the steps and Adelaide is, is with you. She's been with you the whole time. Of course. Um, I'm sorry, I'm at the steps. I have reached the Hop and can see yep. them. Okay. Yep. So, I, so, so they you can are, now enter the fray if you wish. Uh, I'm gonna step forward and very loudly say, "What the hell is going on?" Uh, mother says, "Mutiny! Bloody mutiny!" This isn't what how a family should behave. What's this mutiny about? 
Um, you don't get the impression that uh, the situation will respond to a, uh, a calm approach. So it's really either jump in uh, Great. or, or get out of the way. I'm going to sling a, a, a large woodcutter's axe off of my back. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to sort of pull it out, walk, you know, look, look at mother, just like a very brief moment of eye contact with very little communicated in it. Um, walk forward and I mean, if I can get to the point where I can swing the axe, yep, I'm going to do absolutely. it. Absolutely. All right. And this is, I'm not trying to kill anybody or cause, you know, this is more like probably even like maybe trying to do it with the back of it so that I'm not even hitting with the blade of the thing. I just want to get people to s stop. Great. Um, uh, yeah, well, I'm I'm distracted, so I don't get it. That's a, uh, um, yeah, that's a, that's a 12 to hit. A 12, sorry. A 12 will hit. Oh, great, amazing. Um, then I'll roll a uh, 1d8 plus, whoops, uh, plus two. Uh, oh, that's a nine. Nine damage. Okay. Uh, would you like to just subdue them then, based on what you were saying? Uh, if I can, yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to know. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I you hit him with the back of the axe head. Yeah. Uh -huh. Clunk, yeah. and you, you just see the sailor drop unconscious. Okay. Okay, anything else for your turn? I'm going to yell, can we calm down? That's it. <laughs> Stop <laughs> yelling. <laughs> uh, okay, Tiago. You also have seen this happen, and you're there. What do you want to do? Okay. Um, Tiago, like, yeah, running up the stairs, calls back down. Adelaide, hurry up. It sounds like things are getting Adelaide. She's in front of you now. <laughs> um, just seeing this, seeing Theodore on the ground, seeing Mother kind of trying to calm everybody down. Um, I mean, I've seen seen this before and so I pull out my uh, uh, crossbow um, I'm gonna stay back from where everybody's mostly at but if I can get a clean shot on somebody yeah I will take it absolutely specifically know, somebody around Theodore if, if you take a ranged attack you are definitely going to be shooting to kill oh that's I mean fair. you could shoot to no, that's injure fair. I guess but you're not gonna be able to just sort of knock someone out um Okay, he wouldn't do that then. Never mind. Um, keeping my crossbow, I pull it out, and then I think better. Uh, and I, I will uh, draw my mace instead, um, and I guess use the blunt end of it. <laughs> Everything's the blunt end of a mace, true. right? That's Beautiful. True. That's all blunt. Um, that is the task for which this tool was invented. <laughs> I'll go take a swing at somebody near Theodore. <laughs> Um, 14. Okay, so that hits. Great. Uh, that's gonna be six points of bludgeoning damage. Okay, you knock that sailor out. So there are three down. There are still three hostile sailors, one of whom has a weapon drawn. The other two have um, sheathed their short swords and are trying to drag uh, Theodore's body unconscious body back uh, toward where the captain is. Um, I will... Anything else for Tiago? Sorry, I didn't realize it's still my turn. Um, yeah, I will run at the fray, trying to get to Theodore, basically. Great. Okay, so you can get within um, five feet of them, so within your reach, uh, and then hopefully next turn... We'll see yeah. what happens. Uh, okay, back to their turn. Seeing you approach, uh, the last one who has her weapon drawn is the leader. She is going to swing her. This one's a scimitar at you. That's a 22 to hit. That on me. Yeah, yeah on, on Tiago, oh, sorry. Yes, as that, as Tiago ran hit. toward them. <laughs> um, okay, so that will deal three slashing damage okay and then the other two are going to uh, give up dragging Theodore for the moment and will uh, both swing at Briar okay they'll both miss uh, any way you want to characterize those misses 
I'm going to characterize it first as thank goodness after seven fire damage. Um, <laughs> but I think it's, you know, they come and he just sort of does these these little side steps that don't look like they would get out of the way, but just... <laughs> you know, kind Perfect. Of thing. Perfect. Okay, and it is Adelaide's turn. Uh, Adelaide is going to move closer to Mother and uh, take a protective stance and pull out her crossbow. Um, and she's going to point it at the nearest... Uh, mutineer and try to she wants to try and aim the crossbow and hit them in a way that it like pins them to the mast or something she wants to like pin them by their clothes to a wall or a barrel not necessarily harm them but incapacitate them cool that's that's an interesting use okay yeah so there is a there's a wall there are support beams things like that that you can attempt to do it with so um since you're not going to be doing any damage, it'll just be a regular attack roll, and if you hit, rather than the damage, you'll have, uh, we'll say grappled them, but it'll be with the arrow. Grappled them um, Nice. And she's going to say, sometimes it takes a firm hand. And I rolled a two! Oh no, okay, so it goes off course. Um, you, for a moment you worry that it went into the crowd. Uh, but you see this area of the room is somewhat empty, so it just, ding, sticks into the back wall of the hole. She, like, shakes the crossbow like it's somehow the crossbow's fault. <laughs> uh, anything else for Adelaide? Um, she's going to look to Mother for instruction. Um, Mother says, uh, subdue them. Yes, Mother. Okay. Theodore, make another constant, uh, constitution saving throw. Uh, okay, so that'll be a 16. Okay, Theodore is conscious. You are at one hit point. Um, right. However, you are your speed is zero, so you're unable to stand up, but you are aware enough to speak, and uh, if you wanted to, you could make some kind of action from the prone position. Um, are any of the mutineers still standing in my immediate vicinity? Um, yeah, we'll say that one has, uh, has his back to you. Okay. Um, so at that, like, like, so Theodore is laying there, uh, and then, like, his eyes snap open, um, and, and sort of, like, like, leans up just a little bit to kind of assess what's going on and grumbles to himself and says, every damn time and like turns and reaches across and just tries to grab a hold um, of that person's leg and try and wrestle them to the deck as best he can. Okay, make uh, your athletics check for this grapple with uh, disadvantage. You do have the grappler feet, right? From your human. Mm -hmm. Okay, so does, it doesn't affect the actual grapple attempt, right? But once you have them grappled, uh, you have advantage to hit them? Yes. Okay, cool. What is your athletics check? Um, so my athletics check is going to be, and this is a disadvantage. Yep. So not great. It's going to be an eight total. Okay, that that is better than what uh, what he rolled. So you grab his leg. You have him grappled. If you like, you could um, on your subsequent turn use your action to pull him down to the ground or make your attack uh, just a straight attack at that point because the advantage and disadvantage cancel out okay okay briar um i'm good so there's there's he's just holding on to one you. there's there's two attacking me great and one of them is the leader yes no. okay yes. um I'm, I'm just gonna make a swing i'm gonna try and you know swing the thing back and i'm gonna try and take out her shin bone um okay. with it if i can um uh, i mean best laid plans of mice and men yeah yeah that's a that's an eight so oh well Okay, and you're not raging, correct? Uh, oh, dang it. That was the thing I was going to do. I want to rage. Okay. All right. So uh, it wouldn't have affected that role, but we'll say yes. that you're raging. Um, yes. Which will come in handy on their turn, I'm sure. I would hope so. Anything else for you? Um, well, so when I rage, when I get into a rage, I'm like, does anyone see this damn boat out here? And I'm pointing out to this this the place. Do I see the boat? Is it still there now? Yes. Yeah. Everyone would be able to see it through the okay. portals. Okay. Few. Glad that it's not a, another friggin' illusion. Um, but uh, yeah. So I'm I'm just shouting about that. And you know, anyway. And then I make the make the swing. Don't make it. I'm frustrated. Um, 
Um, that makes me even more pissed off. So, okay. Okay, Tiago, you've got um, one of the sailors attacking you. This is the one that, um, that Theodore has grappled. Okay, great. Um, then I will uh, take another swing at this one. Do I get any kind of... I don't think you get advantage. I think only the grappler gets advantage because of the feat. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, his speed is zero. Okay. Um, I'll just say, uh, have you no faith? And swing my mace. And get a 21 to hit. Great. That'll hit. For five bludgeoning. Okay, it doesn't quite take him down. Um, but you hit him across the head, and you can see he's feeling it. Anything okay. else for your turn? Um, I will... Uh, so there's still two on Briar? That's right. Okay. Including the leader. Okay. Um, I think... I feel like Theodore maybe has this handled, so I'm gonna... <laughs> I'm gonna rush over towards Briar to see if I can help him. Thanks, man. Great. Um, as you do that, the one that you just hit is going to attempt an opportunity attack. Yeah. That might um, since he can't chase you, um, he'll at least try to get his lick in now. So he, that's going to be a 19 to hit. Yep. For uh, four bludgeoning damage. Okay. With a belaying pin. All right. Uh, that brings us back to their turn. So uh, the one that is being held by Theodore by the leg is going to swing down at you. Now, uh, does your grappler feet give you um, any defense against his attacks? Like, would his attack have an, a disadvantage? Uh, so you have an advantage on attack rolls. Uh, you can use your action to pin a creature grappled by you, making another grapple check. If you succeed, you and the creature are both restrained until the grapple ends. So yeah, no, I don't think so. Okay. So he will attack. Oh, and he'll have advantage because because you're prone. Which turns his natural one into a 13. Does that miss? Uh, yes. Okay, so he'll swing and <clears throat> you see the uh, board of the ship deck uh, cave in a little bit under the blow of his belaying pin. And then we've got the two that are attacking Briar. All right, that's going to be two hits, Briar. Right. Uh, 20, 23 and a 19. Yes, certainly. Um, they'll each do half damage from your rage. Good nice. choice. Oh, yeah, good uh, suggested choice. Thank you, Metapidge. <laughs> Barbarian's got a rage, right? Uh, yes, okay, indeed. so the first one will be halved from six down to three bludgeoning damage. Okay. Second one will be uh, three halved down to one slashing damage. That's the leader. Okay. So you're you're mostly fending her off. Are you still yeah. conscious? I'm still up, yeah. Great. Uh, that is the bandit, or the uh, <laughs> the sailor's turn. It's now Adelaide's turn. Alright, so is this this whole thing, is the captain of the ship is the ringleader of this mutiny? Uh, no, you can actually see the captain, uh, Tariq Zet, is sitting in the back of the hold where this is mostly like a common area where people eat um, and he seems to not be taking sides but he looks guilty as though mother would be displeased with something he might have said that then led to this insurrection who and Briar is the one who's in the most trouble it seems I, I'd say so okay then oh, well, I mean Theodore was knocked unconscious but he currently seems to not be attracting a lot of attention okay uh, Adelaide is going to aim her crossbow at one of the uh, mutineers attacking the uh, Briar, and she's going to try and shoot this time to cause harm. Cool. Do you want to do um, an attack against the leader or an attack against uh, the one who's been hit by uh, Briar's attack? Um, I or think... rather, was it Tiago? Tiago. Has Tiago. the leader has the leader been hit at all? No. I want to attack the leader. Ah, I rolled a two. Uh, I'm not good at this crossbow thing. Yeah, well, it's dangerous firing into melee. Maybe you've been too careful trying not to hit your friends and your bolt goes wide. 
Is there anything else you want to try to do? You still got some movement, bonus action. Um, uh, I want to move over to the captain and say, do you not see this ship? He looks at you with a um, an expression that you've seen before, which is just utter pity, as if he's looking at someone who is experiencing a personal tragedy. And uh, he says, I am sorry for my part in this, but I, I cannot restrain their feelings. They will do as they will. But who's steering the ship? There is a helmsman above. Well then, who? Adelaide gets frustrated because she doesn't know boats. <laughs> <laughs> so she says, shouldn't we be steering away from the ship heading towards us? Isn't that also important right now? He she's, looks out she's... the window and for the first time, because of what you've said, notices this other ship. And he does stand up and seems to, though he doesn't say anything else, uh, he seems to be a little bit concerned. Yeah, I would think so. Um, and Adelaide is just thinking about the image of a burning ship in her brain. Um, and then I'm gonna move back out so that I'm ready to try and attacking again next round. Great. Um, at the end of your turn, he will um, go up from a set of stairs that are on the far side where you've moved. And um, he goes up to the top deck and you hear him shouting orders. Okay, Theo. Okay, um, so having grappled uh, and and having seen that uh, Thiago had, had inflicted some measure of damage, um, I think that, uh, that Theo is going to like lift himself up onto this gentleman's leg and, and perhaps bite down on his calf as hard as he possibly can, and try and roll all of his weight into him, try and collapse him uh, onto the deck, not having access to any weapon. I'm assuming I've probably dropped my longsword. And so, right. like, just, you know, out of uh, necessity, bite into his flesh as hard as I can and roll my full weight into his leg. That's the soldier speaking. Uh, so, <laughs> so make a, an unarmed strike with advantage from your grapple. And uh, it's going to be dealing 1d4, uh, well, sorry, it'll deal 1 plus your strength modifier, but piercing damage from your bite. Okay. Uh, it's going to be a natural 20. <laughs> <laughs> Critical bite! So, um, oh, and, I, and I, you'll have to remind me, do, do we confirm? Or is that not a part of 5th edition? Yes, yes. So we're okay. using, for those watching, we're using a dynamic critical hits variant, which um, you can find on the darkplane.com website. Uh, so you'll roll another d20, uh, okay. which will determine the severity of the critical hit. It's a one. <laughs> okay, so you'll just roll double damage dice as a normal critical hit would. Okay. Oh, so... but there's no damage dice. Right. So un unfortunately, in this scenario, you're just going to do the it's a raw. double of one. You won't you won't double the modifier, so the critical right. hit just doesn't. It, it's probably reasonable that you couldn't critically bite someone to death. It hurts. The it tendon. Hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And what was the damage amount? Um, I believe it's yeah, it's three bludgeoning that's that's going to transition into three slashing. Okay, so that is enough for him <laughs> to fall down, and we'll just say uh, you're able to then once he hits the the deck. Um, you can finish the job and knock him out, or if that's what you want to do. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Great, okay. That was the one that had been damaged by Tiago. So now we've got the leader and one other, both attacking Briar. And it is Briar's turn. All right, going for the leader again. Uh, that's a 21 to hit. Okay, that hits her. And then uh, five on the D8, uh, plus four for the weapon. I believe, or is it plus two for the weapon? Plus two for the weapon, so seven. And then do I do extra damage as raging? Yes, plus two. Okay, so nine damage. Okay, that'll do it. Um, what, how would you like to characterize this? Yeah, so I, I swing the thing around like I was trying to do before and smack her on the sh side of her shin. If it breaks her leg, great, but. Yeah, you, you hear the leg break. She, <laughs> she kind of cries out, hits the deck, um, isn't entirely unconscious, but is defeated and, and won't be getting back up anytime yeah. soon. Yeah. 
Um, you can now hear the captain again shouting orders, uh, sounding much, much more frantic at this point. And glancing out the porthole, you can see the bow of the drifting vessel is now pointed directly at the cabin where you're all having this confrontation. Um, any other movement from Briar? You're next to one conscious enemy who is the last one left. And, and actually, let me tell you, uh, as, as the leader goes down, he will drop his belaying pin and hold his hands up and say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, I didn't mean anything. We'll, we'll stop. We'll go where you want us to go. Yeah, Briar just looks around at the, at the situation, making sure that everything is set, but has no comment on anything. Just sort of nods at him, you know, confirming, yeah, I'm not gonna hit you either. Okay, so we'll end initiative there. And uh, if anyone wants to do anything, uh, let me know. Outside, I mean, just like, um, yeah, I guess Tiago, uh, first kind of laying eyes on this ship that's inbound. Um, what? What is that? What's happening here? Um, you can see it's it's about mm, huge judge, 120 feet away. So maybe in the next 10, 15 seconds, uh, it's heading straight for the ship, and will probably strike you. But uh, everybody, take cover! Take cover! Um, and um, he's gonna. As as you're looking out, you can see stuff in the water. Um, they look like bobbing cargo or debris. Uh, that's that's all around the sea surrounding this vessel. Um, but you have enough perception to realize that they're actually bodies. Oh no. <laughs> um, Tiago's going to go to mother. Um, Try maybe like picking up somebody who's maybe injured on the way. I'll, I'll go grab okay. uh, a Theodore. You got about 15 seconds. I'm gonna help Theodore up to his feet and try to okay. go away from where the ship is going to impact. Great. Uh, do you want to go below or above? Uh, not not below. So <laughs> above, <laughs> I suppose. Okay. Anyone else doing anything for the next 15 seconds? Uh, I would do the same. I would I would follow after uh, Tiago, um, knowing that uh, Tariq would probably need help and do so woozily like having just been knocked unconscious mm -hmm. if i'll i'll go to briar and try to get briar to go downstairs too or to wherever we're going yeah i think briar with if uh if adelaide would permit it would grab her lift her and carry her downstairs yep <laughs> downstairs you, you guys are going downstairs <laughs> or wherever uh, the safe safe spot is looks like you're, everyone's heading up Okay, we're from, heading up. From the group. Not, yeah. not in the wrong direction. We're heading in the right direction <laughs> that we're supposed to do that is the smart thing. I, I, honestly, I, I'm not sure which would be safer, but I, I'm guessing that not being below a ceiling would be good if the ship's going to have an impact. Well, so, I mean, I, what, I'm, I, I, what I'd be looking for is the strongest structural, the point of the strongest structural integrity. That's what I'd be looking great. for. Great, which would probably be the, the poop deck where the helm is. I great. do like to imagine, though, that we start to go downstairs and then, like, Adelaide's over his shoulder and she's like, no, 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 up, up, up. And then <laughs> yes. I turn around. He's <laughs> like, like, I don't know freaking boats. <laughs> it's still, like, the rage is wearing off. Uh... As Theodore groggily reaches the top following Tiago, um, you can see that there are currently a number of the sailors who were not involved in the confrontation downstairs. Um, they are throwing anchor down in an attempt to quickly turn the boat about and uh i don't know if you would call this araculi drift but uh yeah <laughs> so so they're trying to quickly get the boat to turn and avoid at least taking a uh you know a t-bone strike from this other vessel um is there anything you'd like to do to help with that either tiago or theodore uh is there anything I can do? What I don't even. What would I be able to do to help? You you just got moments, and you can see that they're attempting to do this maneuver. And you think, if there's anything that comes to mind, you might be able to influence the the outcome. Um, I say, uh, I I shout, everybody lean to that side, <laughs> whichever side we're drifting to, I suppose. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Make a um. Uh, charisma, and then if there's if you want to add persuasion, that okay. that would work. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, Proficiency. no change, but okay. Natural twenty. Oh, okay. Uh, 
So Tiago's commanding presence uh, suddenly draws all the attention and everyone uh, who is not performing a uh, necessary task <laughs> yeah. charges to one side of the ship. Uh, how about Theodore? Anything you want to do? You have experience well, with these kinds of vessels. That's what I was going to say. Like, like, like seeing exactly what it is that the, the sailors are attempting to do. I think that uh, Theo would immediately just sort of throw himself. So if they are trying to heave anything or, or pulling anything through with a rope, he'll immediately just try and, and, and fall in behind them and, and put his full weight and strength in this, uh, in this sort of desperate uh, attempt to avoid this collision. Great. Okay. So, uh, Theodore, I'm going to make um, an athletics check to represent the uh, activity of the crew and everyone who is following Tiago's instructions. If you would also make a check, there's going to be a group check between you and me. So as long as one of us succeeds a uh, pretty high DC, it'll work. Okay, so that's going to be a 19 for me. Okay, we both succeeded. So, uh, as that's this awesome. maneuver happens, um, Briar and Adelaide come up just in time to see the ship go <laughs> and like the uh, waves are crashing above the level of the deck um, as it quickly turns about running to now be parallel with the vessel that is going toward it. And you hear this uh, agonizing scrape and crunch as the two ships shear past one another um, in the water, and you have avoided uh, what would have definitely been um, a fatal wreck of your own ship. Oh. And we are going to end the session there, and we'll pick up oh. next week. Oh, Ooh, man. Amazing. Wow. Oh. Thanks, everyone. Um, oh, we made fantastic. it. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Wow. I hope uh, no one had any kind of anxiety attacks. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. and, uh, our audience members. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't practiced saying goodbye yet. Um, oh, is there anything anyone would like to announce or say anything? Yeah, we hit 50 followers. Woo Thank you, everybody. Yay! Amazing. Our goal. Oh, oh. That was that was all thanks to you guys. And I, that was a really fun stream, you guys. Thank you, Graham, for DMing that. Oh. Thank oh, you yeah, all so great. much. Oh, my so gosh. Good. I can't I'm so wait. excited to keep going. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Can't I'm really wait. excited. <laughs> Freaking right, creepy well. cat. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you all so much for this wonderful terror stew you've uh, created for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. Um, the only other thing, um, if you liked what you saw tonight, make sure you tune in for our other two shows that we have on this channel. Um, Pitfalls and Ponies, which is the polar opposite of what you saw tonight, but will be a <laughs> romp of a good time. That's going to be uh, this upcoming Sunday morning at uh, 1030 Central Standard Time. And then um, the green room uh, where I will be talking with members of the cast of both this show and Pitfalls and Ponies. And we'll be talking about uh, role playing and all kinds of stuff, um, and that'll be on Tuesday nights uh, at eight thirty Central. That's all. Thanks for amazing. Right. Thanks everyone. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, say right. goodbye. <laughs> See ya. See ya. Goodbye everybody. Peace.